Hello and welcome to Cybertron lecture number four of this fall. Teams around the world are preparing for the Cybertron competitions next year. My name is Roland Sigrist and I'm an, I am the co-head of the project of Cybathlon of ETH Zurich and also the head of competition of Cybathlon. We are very happy um, that we received a lot of feedback when we initiated the Cybathlon lectures. We asked teams, Cybathlon teams and the Cybathlon community around the world which topics they would be interested in and where we can share our network and our experts around the world can share their expertise in developing assistive technologies for people with disabilities. We already had three lectures. Uh, the first lecture was with Christian Bermas about how and why to succeed at Cybathlon. You can still watch the lectures online on our website. Then we had a talk of uh, Tobias Wellerdick and Max Erik Busigravitz about motors and energy supply. And last week, the lecture of about bridging the gap between human-centered design and technolo technological implementation of Jan Meyer and Mag Max Erik Busigravitz. Today, I'm very happy to welcome also Heike Valeri. Uh, I know Heike since quite a while, and I would like to quickly introduce uh, her to the audience. Heike received her engineering degree in mechanical engineering with honors from the RWTH Aachen University in 2004. Since then, she has been working on robot assisted assisted rehabilitation and prosthetic, prosthetic legs in close collaboration with clinicians and partners from industry. She received her uh, uh, PhD in engineering from the Tec Technische Universität München in 2009. From 2008 to 11, she worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Sensory Motor Systems Lab at ETH Zurich. This is also the laboratory where the Cybathlon was born. At that time, she and her collaborators started realizing diverse transparent robotic interfaces for 3D overground gate training, which are now enabling groundbreaking research and recovery after spinal cord injury. From 2011 to 12, she worked at Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi as an assistant professor and she joined T TU Delft in 20, uh, 2012 in the same function. In 2019, she became a full professor at TU Delft. And since November 2019, she also holds an honorary professorship at the Department for Rehabilitation Medicine and at Erasmus MC in Rotterdam. Heike has published more than 100 peer-reviewed publications filed 15 patent applications and received diverse fellowships and awards, such as the first prize of the EU Robotic Technology Transfer Award in 2014 and a VD Fellowship in 2016 from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. In April 2023, 20, she moved back to RWTH Aachen, so she, where she started her research career, as an Alexander from Humboldt professor, where she now heads the Institute of Automatic Control. She remains affiliated with the TU Delft at Erasmus MC, mainly focusing on minimalistic and unconventional con conceptus to support human gait and balance. This is uh, quite a CV. Uh, Heike is a, a, a true expert in the field, and I'm very happy that we could can have her today for the lecture about over-engineering in human-machine interaction. Heike, with that, in a second, I would like to hand over to you. Just a short announcement. After the lecture, you have the possibility, or already during the lecture, you have the possibility to ask questions with the Q&A function in Zoom. We will uh, try to uh, answer these questions then after the talk of Heike. So with that, thank you very much, Heike, for being here. And the uh, Zoom meeting is yours. Thank you very much for those kind words, Roland. I will try to share my screen now. Yes, you already told uh, the audience 
quite a bit about me. I need to say a disclaimer, some of the technology that, that I will be showing has been patented and there, there might be a financial benefit if any of these devices are sold. So um, I want you to know that. So, well, I have been working on uh, diverse robotic devices in the past, mostly robotic devices that help people move uh, or, or that move by themselves. For example, prosthetic legs or uh, walking robots, uh, but also body weight support systems um, and just in general actuators that can be used to, um, to build wearable or interactive robotic devices. At the beginning of my career, I focused more on the control engineering part and later I started also designing and controlling devices uh, together. So that's a, a somewhat a development that I made. And I learned a lot during these years. And of course, I made many mistakes. And uh, Roland asked me, and I'm happy to comply to share, especially some of the mistakes during this lecture. So I would not only show you solutions that I think worked quite nicely, but also, yeah, very painful detours that we took that cost us a lot of time and didn't really lead to the success that we were hoping for. So I hope that that will also help you make better decisions. Okay, so I'll, I'd like to start with a small exercise. Namely, here's a, here's a, a set of white and green squares. And you have the task to make this symmetric. That means it has to be symmetric top down and left right. And the question is how would you modify this? How would you change colors of those tiles in order to make this symmetric? Probably already have something in mind and maybe you already changed your mind. Many people will have as the very first intuition to add more green tiles to make this symmetric. And that is actually something that is consistently found and it's, it's in human nature. We tend to try to solve problems by adding something. We only rarely think about removing pieces. And only if you think in that direction, you will see that it's a lot easier to actually remove green tiles at the top left corner compared to adding green tiles in all the other corners. Well, that's something that you have to consciously think about. Maybe there is a better way to do this. And uh, it might not be your very first intuition. And of course, engineers are humans too. So we have exactly the same problem. And we also tend to think about making things better by adding stuff to them. And I'd, I'd like to invite you to just always consciously think about whether there might be another way of doing this. Okay, I'd like to... Um, structure my talk around a couple of lessons learned or lessons that I learned I would like to share. And one of the very first also starts with the V model, basically in the requirements phase, being very sure what your requirements are and then designing actually for these requirements and not for something else or for something more. And that also includes double checking assumptions that you very quickly might make in the requirements phase. Okay, I'll give an example. One of the challenges that we tried to solve, and this was still in Zurich, was to build an environment where people could safely train walking over ground. This was for people who, for example, um, had a spinal cord injury or a stroke, and they would like to train again um, without the fear or the risk of falling. And also potentially with a little bit of help um, in supporting their body weight because they might not yet be strong enough to support it by themselves. And this was a question or request that Mark Bolliger put forward, head of the Paralab at Balgrist. And uh, so I set about with a team of people to make a solution for this. And we basically translated this into the technical requirement, make a device that can create a force vector that is finally controlled in three directions on the human body. And we found a really nice solution, uh, which is the so-called float robot, which had four large motors with winches connected to them. And then via cables, we could um, control the force that was acting on the person who in turn was connected to those cables via a harness and a sling bar overhead. And you see some elements in this design, which I think are quite um, 
helpful. And one of those elements are passively displacing deflection units. So those deflection units move thanks to the forces in the cables themselves. We don't need extra actuators for this. This makes it possible to have a really large workspace compared to what you would normally have with, with cable robots or any parallel robot, which are normally constrained to a rather small workspace. And then there's a second element in here, which are springs, or actually sp springs with some viscoelasticity combined, uh, which function as series elastic elements. I suppose many of you, if you have uh, built uh, wearable robotic systems in the past, are familiar with the concept of series elastic actuation, which means that you deliberately, de deliberately put a physical compliance in series with your motor. So you have a motor, a physical compliance, and th then the load. The advantage of placing this extra element is that you can better control small forces and also that you can cheaply measure those forces by means of the elongation of those elastic elements. So we built this device and it also enabled a pretty nice um, experience of walking in it, falling, being caught, and so forth. What we realized when we started testing it is that this was extremely sensitive, or people were extremely sensitive to the horizontal forces that we applied. Only a very small force uh, would already be sufficient to bring them out of balance. And not so uh, clear was the influence of the vertical forces. So um, it appeared that it is indeed a good idea to make very precise control of these horizontal forces. For the vertical forces, it's not so clear. It's not even that clear what you would like there. And in the requirements, we had intuitively said, well, we want to have a constant force. So that was more or less an implicit as assumption because, well, gravity is a constant. If you want to take away part of the body's gravitational pull, then you would like to have a constant force in the opposite direction, just like gravity is constant. So we thought that we would need very precise control and very a good actuation to be able to keep this unloading force constant, despite the movement that the person might make. And you know that during gait, people move slightly up and down and that can perturb the force control loop. This requires quite an engineering effort because it's not so easy to render a constant force. It's much easier to make variable forces, for example, with the spring. Then uh, if you have movement, you will have to live with a certain variation in your force. But of course, this assumption was an assumption that we had made rather intuitively or that many people probably make intuitively. So after having built this device and also having observed that um, the vertical forces were not that critical compared to the horizontal, we went back to this assumption. And we asked ourselves, could it be that this is actually not even the best possible way of controlling body weight support? So we started with the simulation study, a very smart master student, Salil Apte, did the study um, advised by Michiel Ploy, a postdoc back then, and myself. And he compared to three different uh, solutions, or let's say general principle of body weight support. One of them being this constant force, which we assume would be the best. One of them being a counterweight, which means that uh, the part of your body mass that you want to be compensated is also added to the system at some other point, and it counterbalances. And the third solution is spring. This is actually the most easy uh, solution. You would just have to attach a person to an elastic cable. And then by changing the offset of that spring, you could have a, a modulation of the uh, unloading. Now, the question was, which of these would be um, would perform in which way when comparing the gate in body weight support to gate without body weight support. And what we would like to see is that people walk the same in both conditions, because what we actually want to train in the neural rehabilitation environment is what people will later do without the robot, without the support. So we would like to also do the same type of movement or motor control that they would do without the device. Well, then, of course, we had to choose some measure, and we chose 
um, a number, the modular W, which was proposed as a measure of dynamic similarity of gait, which is basically related to gait frequency or cadence and to gait speed. And we looked at how is this dynamic similarity affected by the three different conditions, the constant force, the counterweight, and the spring. And surprisingly, we did not see the constant force as the best possible condition. Well, I must admit it wasn't completely surprising to us because we had already thought about this theoretically, and we had assumed that the spring would perform better. But uh, indeed, the simulations also confirmed this, um, this hypothesis. And uh, if you think about it, it basically means um, if you take away part of your body weight, you do take away part of gravity, but you leave all of the inertia, which means that basically the eigenfrequency of gait changes, which you can observe if you see someone walking on the, if, on the moon. If you watch those videos, you will see that people walk with a much lower frequency because they still have the same inertia, but a different gravitational pull. Of course, we want people to train walking on Earth, so we would like to have them approximately the same frequency as they would have without the body weight unloading. So we would like to somehow compensate um, this loss of gravitational pull, and we thought that probably a spring would be suitable to increase that eigenfrequency again. And we did calculate an optimal um, or the appro appropriate value for the spring constant to get this frequency back to where we thought it should be. And indeed, the simulations confirmed that this would be a better cho choice than the constant force. And that's um, not only nice because it confirms our hypothesis, but also because it makes design a lot, a lot easier. It's so much easier to build something that um, has a, an elastic behavior than to build something that exhibits a constant force. If you ever try to build a constant force mechanism, you will probably agree. Now with this new knowledge, we actually set about to build a different type of robot that would not anymore allow a precise force control in all three directions, but only in the horizontal ones, which we learned were the most important from the requirements. And in the vertical degree of freedom, it would rely more on passive dynamics to actually give a springy behavior. And this is the resulting system, now this is called the, the Ryzen is the principle for the Ryzen bodyweight support robot, which was built and commercialized by Motec in the Netherlands. And what you see here is some winches again, but these winches are very low bandwidth. So they, they, those are motors with large gearboxes, but very low power. So we have large forces, which we do need to support people's body weight, but we don't have the large power that we would need to control very finely and to enable high velocities. Instead, we'll, we'll rely on these springs that you see here, very large and strong springs that are in series again with the motor. So it's still a serious elastic actuator. And then this additional uh, mechanical element enables the lateral degree of freedom, supported more by passive mechanics than supported by high power motors. And this variable radius winch, I would like to uh, show you a little bit more. It basically transports cable one, from one side of the room to the other. So it helps people move left and right. And it uh, makes sure that the motors don't need to change, uh, don't need to move much, or the large main motors don't need to move much. And we also don't need large torque in the variable radius winch in order to hold the different forces in the cables. Now, if you look at this from the front, it's a little bit easier to see. Here you see a person walking left and right, and then there's this variable radius winch very much hidden. It's behind these uh, boxes, but it's basically transporting cable left and right, and at the same time, just by kinematic coupling, changes its radius. In this animation, you can see it even better. See how the, cable, uh, how the cables uh, change their kinematic configuration. Now, if you're on the very left, then the green cable would have to support more of your body weight than the red cable. But if you are at the left, the green cable encounters a much smaller radius on that winch than the red cable. And since the torque is the product of force and lever arm, we can design this winch in such a way that we actually have no torque on the winch at all, even though the two forces are different. That means we don't even need a motor 
of course, we did put in a motor uh, mainly because it uh, uh, can compensate some friction. It can also pull people laterally, actively, and also it can compensate for some modeling inaccuracies. But in general, we need a very, very small motor, just like we need small motors also for the main vertical degree of freedom. That means we can build an extremely low power system that does almost the same as before, but can be connected to a normal power outlet on the wall. It doesn't need any uh, power electronics compared to what we built before. So this is a, let, let's say this is a, a, a success story in the end, I think, where we, where we managed to build something that uh, um, exploits passive dynamics, exploits mechanics, and also exploits the fact that our requirements don't even tell us that we need any constant force in vertical direction. We are actually even better off with the passive realization of that degree of freedom, it's almost passive, where we use those springs instead. The Ryzen is also a product and it's uh, being sold um, and many people um, are using it in therapy. Here you see an example of a child who's uh, trying to do some exercises that some creative therapists have designed. And you see that there's a lot of freedom for the person to experience um, the environment and the robot is just, just providing some safety and a little bit of help. Okay, after this, I'll go to another very painful story, namely um, the gyroscopic backpack project. And let's say one of the prototypes we built in it. And I think that exemplifies the risks of combining two good ideas and expecting that you will get an even better idea or a better solution. So the gyroscopic backpack project, one of my biggest projects, is basically based on the idea that you put fast spinning wheels onto a person's back. And then if you turn these wheels around another axis here, the green axis, you can get a large output torque, a gyroscopic torque, which here is the red arrow as a superposition of the two individual arrows from the two gyroscopes. And this torque can be applied to the human body and ideally help the person in some way maintain balance. For example, just give a little bit of extra time to then react and place the step themselves. So that's the, that's the general idea. I've been working on this now for over 10 years and we have built a whole range of prototypes. You see here some, uh, some versions. The first generation on the left up to the fourth generation on the very right. I'm quite happy now with the fourth generation. We, are, we have reached a very small weight and a realistic effort in building these devices. But in between there were quite some, quite some uh, setbacks. And I think some of those were due to over-engineering. And I'd like to focus on the second generation, which was, let's say, uh, um, accumulation of several probably judgment mistakes on my end. And uh, so what was the whole idea? The idea was, well, a conventional control moment gyroscope, as, as you saw in the animation, creates a gyroscopic torque by rotating a flywheel about some gimbal. Now, if you add another gimbal, that was the idea, we could make sure that this gyroscopic torque isn't transmitted directly through the gimbal structure, but through an elastic element. So we have again a serious elastic actuator, in this case, a serious elastic gyroscope. And then we thought, well, oh, maybe we can even use these gimbals to have some sort of fail safe mechanism so that if the torque gets too high, the gimbal will just disengage and the flywheel will just stay uh, in its current orientation while the person rotates around it. So we thought maybe we can even build a, a bistable mechanism in there that would at some point function as a torque limiter. And before that point, it would function as the serious elasticity. And this was all done by Daniel Lemos, who was a PhD student and invested a lot of his time into this. And uh, he made also this really nice animation where you see how it works. You get a gyroscopic torque. It first leads to the springs um, deflecting. At some point, the bistable mechanism would, will even detach uh, the whole thing and you get a decoupled gyroscope. Well, in the end, we, we didn't build the decoupling mechanism in this way, but we did build a compliant gyroscope or actually two of them. You see Daniel wearing the two. This is just a picture. We never really switched it on on anybody's back. 
because, well, if you compare it to our previous version, it was quite a lot better in terms of being able to generate more torque. It was also a little bit lighter because we invested a lot of time into optimizing for weight. It would allow an unlimited gimbal range of motion. We could sense the gyroscopic torque through those springs and we could even uh, provide the safety decoupling mechanism. But in the end, after we had built this all, it became obvious that this was just too much. It was too expensive, it was too complex, and it didn't even function very well. So in the end, we published one conference paper on this and abandoned the whole concept after a lot of effort and time. So this is really still painful for me to talk about, but I hope um, I made my point clear that just combining two good ideas is sometimes a very bad idea. So in this case, control moment gyroscopes and serious elastic actuation. Now, another positive note. So for the very same problem of protecting people who are prone to falls, we have on the very other end of the spectrum, an extremely minimalistic type of technology. And here we have been collaborating with a company in the Netherlands who was building airbags. And we were making the algorithms for these airbags. So here you see Patricia Baines who developed the core of these algorithms and she's being pushed. And if you watch very closely, you see that the airbag she's wearing is inflating right before she hits the ground. So those algorithms worked really nicely. And this product is now also on the market or has been for a while already. Here you see um, uh, uh, an animation of how it works. These are some sensors, actually on three locations, we have IMUs in the belt and we process the information of these IMUs and thereby realize when the person is falling. And then right before the impact occurs, of course, in time to still inflate the airbag, uh, we will deploy the airbag. So this was of course challenging in terms of algorithm development, but it's really not a complex technology. And this really has an impact uh, on people's lives who can now um, yeah, enjoy walking without uh, or with less risk. By now, the Volk has already become quite a successful product. There are about 1,000 people who use it every day. And according to Volk, they observe about six falls in this population per day. And of course, you don't know whether all of these falls would have led to injury or to injury to the hip, but at least um, the risk gets lower when you wear such a device. And this has been confirmed by an um, observational study, at least. So not yet a randomized clinical study, but at least there were some indications that indeed the number of hip fractures can be reduced with such technology. Okay, so that was a very large contrast between the complex gyroscope and this very simple technology. Let's go to another set of um, small ideas that I have for you that can help um, reduce complexity. And I think one of those ideas is to try and give components a double function. So to look at can one, one component, for example, be structural and also have some sort of uh, elastic uh, properties or um, other functions. And I'll, I'll talk especially about springs because that is something that I have worked with quite a bit in the past. And uh, there's two uh, mechanisms that I would like to show to you how actually one spring can be both a series spring and a parallel spring. So I showed you before how a series spring can be helpful in terms of series elastic actuation. A parallel spring can be helpful in relieving a motor of a certain torque that it needs to provide. And in some cases, you can use exactly the same spring to do both, both, both uh, things. So in the first example, this is the multidimensional compliant decoupled actuator, we called it the Mukta. It's a, it's a combination of springs that are connected to a person's pelvis. And they are part of a larger system, which was a sort of a redesign of the locomat. They're also a very complex system. We were trying to, to make a complete uh, actuation that was very transparent and compliant and also to add some degrees of freedom that or at least allow the person to have some more freedom when they walk, especially uh, in terms of their pelvis movements. And that's why we created this system. 
And what you see here is a simplified depiction of it uh, on the bottom left. You see how these springs connect the pelvis plate, which is connected to the person, to the middle plate, which then a motor moves with, with respect to a fixed plate. So these very same springs are in series with this motor as long as they deflect in this lateral direction, but they are in parallel in all other degrees of freedom, or they are actually in that case, the only mechanism that supported the human uh, pelvis. And here's a, here's a video where you see how this works. This is just a motor switched off. You can see that um, you need quite some force to move this thing back and forth because you need to move against the uh, motor. But once the motor is switched on, it is using the deflection of these cables in the lateral or the springs in the lateral direction in order to control the force. While in the all, all the other degrees of freedom, you have the same springs and also some some additional springs that don't have such large components in lateral direction uh, support your pelvis in the other direction. And that can, for example, be helpful to guide uh, to guide the pelvis to keep it within a certain range, but also potentially to modify the eigenfrequency, as you saw before in the body weight support system. Now we did a very small evaluation study of this, which really is not uh, um, an exhaustive study, but it appears that with this system, we can actually control um, still the force in lateral direction quite well, and that people still move approximately the way that they would move um, when they are just on the treadmill without wearing this additional pelvis support. Okay, so that was one example of how one spring can have two roles, basically splitting it in degrees of freedom. But it's even possible to have one spring have the same roles in one degree of freedom. And I'd like to come to the second example, which is part of the feet simulator, feet simulator project, which is a, a bicycle simulator. We just call it the feet simulator because it's built for the province of Friesland. And uh, the Frisian word for bike is uh, feats. So this was built based on the requirements that Dick DeVard put forward. And he's a professor in Groningen. He works in traffic psychology. And he wanted a device that would enable elderly users to practice their balance during cycling or to assess how good their balance was. So uh, this system had to be realistic in that it would resemble cycling on the street, but it also had to be very, very safe for people who cannot yet balance. You can't, for example, put them on a bicycle, on a treadmill or anything like that, uh, which other simulators might, might be able to, but it has to be very safe. It also needs to be able to um, function at very low speeds, including people getting on and off that bike. That's also something that Dick would like to train. And that already precludes quite a lot of engineering solutions that might come to your mind for building this. So, for example, we can't really build this um, bicycle on a hexapod for multiple reasons. One of them being the ground would be tilting together with the bike, which means that you cannot train getting on and off. And second, if we want a realistic behavior of the bike, we should also have a realistic inertia of the bike. And it's pretty much impossible to make a realistic inertia of the bike that's mounted on a platform still resemble only that inertia of a bike. So we had to build something very different. And what we did build was also constantly interrupted by us thinking, why don't we add more degrees of freedom? Why don't we add this and that? But we constantly had to restrain ourselves to build exactly what was needed for these requirements. And that basically meant having a steering degree of freedom, a propulsion degree of freedom, and a leaning degree of freedom to practice balance. And that's the result. And if you look at this, it still looks almost like a bike, or at least I think it still looks almost like a bike because we have hidden all of the actuators in those saddlebags and under the ground. So that way people don't even notice or hopefully don't notice right away that this is not a standard bike. That, so of course the psychological effect here is quite important. And then we see here the three degrees of freedom, steering, propulsion, and lean.
Now, the challenge of this is if you look at these equations of motion of the bicycle, and if you want to know all the definitions of the variables, and I put the paper down here, this is a really nice paper from uh, Aaron Schwab and uh, Jaap Meyert and others who found out or described for us uh, um, what the linearized equations of motion of a bicycle are. Later, they use these for very important findings of why a bicycle is stable, but this is not something I will go into. I'd just like to draw your attention to these two terms here, which are dependent on V, which is the velocity of the bike. And of course, in the simulator, the, the bike has no velocity. So you're lacking all of these centrifugal uh, effects here. Of course, the gravitational effects are still present in the simulator. If you, if you place a heavy rider on the bicycle, there will be a large gravitational moment, but it's not counterbalanced anymore by these velocity dependent effects that would normally keep you in dynamic balance on a bicycle when going around corners. Now we will have to build some sort of actuator structure that's capable of counterbalancing those gravitational effects. And they can be pretty large, if you have a heavy rider, we calculated that we need to get to something like 500 Newton meters. And then building a motor and gearbox combination for 500 Newton meters, that's actually quite a large motor and a big gearbox. And that would lead to high inertia, high installed power, and that could both jeopardize the transparency of the device, so the reflected inertia, and of course the safety, just because of the high power that you installed. So here we designed yet a new solution. And this is actually the first time I'm presenting this. We'll also be presenting this next week at the Bicycle and Motorcycle Dynamics Conference. But maybe some of you can uh, make use of this concept, which is basically um, the idea of displacing the two axles from each other. So the axle, the leaning axle of the bike is not the axle that we actuate, but we have a motor that is placed higher up at quite some distance from this uh, from this bicycle leaning um, axis. And it's connected via a crank and then a set of springs to the bike, which in this case here is the, the driven member. And uh, what you can imagine is that we get quite some nonlinear characteristics. And that's actually what we want. So if you look at how this spring force can be decomposed into a component that's uh, radial to the motor, and that's tangential with respect to that crank trajectory, then you see that one of those two components will be creating a moment with respect to the motor, with this a tangential one, so that's a series effect, and one of them will not be creating a torque on the motor. It's just um, absorbed in the bearings, and that's the spring force that's basically acting in parallel to the motor because also that spring force component does create a torque with respect to the bicycle. So we have the parallel effect of the springs, which is support against gravity and also some soft end stops. So the system still um, can function without the motor being powered. And we have a component that's acting in series. So we have again, a series elastic actuator, but that's basically both done by a single spring. We just have two springs to have an antagonistic setup, but both springs do the same. They also, they both have a series and a parallel effect. And all of this is just due to the nonlinearity of displacing the two axles uh, with respect to each other. Here's a sneak preview of what this does. On the left, you see someone trying to tilt the bicycle and you see how those springs prevent it. The motor is switched off and you see just the parallel effect of these springs just holding the bicycle in place. Of course, if you switch on the motor, you can compensate for that effect and uh, create any force that you would like um, in force control, obviously only within the, the actuation range. So we need to know quite well in advance which forces we want to generate in order to make sure that, uh, that, it's, that it's possible. But in this case, we do know that quite well. So you see here how one spring can have two roles, and that allowed us to build a very, very small motor. Uh, just uh, um, there's a factor of three between approximately, of course, that factor varies with the geometry between the between the motor torque and the actual bicycle torque. Um, and in the end, in the end stops, 
the motor is not providing any torque at all and just device, just the springs hold the system in place. Of course, you can imagine that this actuation principle can be used for any sort of um, situation where you know in advance where in the workspace you need certain forces, for example, end stops. And then it might be helpful to also just displace your motor axle from the joint axle. Okay, now here's a, a video of how this works in practice. You see uh, Christina Kola, PhD student, uh, cycling on the bicycle. Here she's cycling and you see how there's very small lean movements just because she's trying to to cycle and balance the bike and she's doing that by actually steering so the same way that you would do on the street you you keep you maintain balance by steering and you see also in the second video how this works also when trying to start up which is of course when there's no velocity and it's a little bit easy, little bit more difficult to maintain balance. And once you get up to speed, it becomes easier to maintain balance again. So it looks like we're like we're on the way towards something that's quite realistic, but we have not even started evaluating that this, let alone finished building the whole simulator and its controls. Okay, now I'd like to do one last topic, which is the idea that constraints can be very, very helpful to find better solutions. And one of those constraints um, was brought to us by the idea uh, that we could build a sort of mixture between a robotic companion and an exercise device. In this case, a robotic ball, uh, the simplest possible exercise device that would motivate people to play with it and to move, for example, children, but also elderly people to just, uh, uh, just increase their activity by interacting with this device. And this was an idea originally from the Faculty of Industrial Design at TU Delft, Marco Rosendahl brought this idea forward and he was looking for a technical solution for this. Of course, um, there's many challenges. Uh, one of the reasons why we're trying to build this is because um, technology often increases instead of decreases the gap in healthcare. So people who have low health literacy, so who, who find it difficult to manage their own health in the healthcare system in the country where they live, um, are often disadvantaged by new technology. And once you bring in screens, once you bring in the need to, to type commands or to operate some sort of technical system, you increase this gap and you leave many people behind. Uh, so we want a system that's a requirement that is completely screen-free, doesn't require any screen, not even a smartphone app. We also don't want to collect any data. We don't want to have a microphone or a camera in this ball because that could invade privacy. So we have quite a limited set of sensors that we can use to detect uh, what the ball is doing and how people are interacting with it. And by the nature of this ball, we also have very little ways of expressing ourselves. So the ball doesn't have any hands or feet. It doesn't have a face. It doesn't even speak. So it's uh, very limited in what it can do. So it basically has to express all of this through movement. And what we built here is a very, very simple actuation a principle that would be capable of at least rolling roughly in the right direction. Of course, what the right direction is remains to be decided by a higher level controller that's also coupled to what the person is doing. But uh, the actuation principle here is extremely simple and capable of rolling in two directions, even though we have only one motor. So once again, we are, have an underactuated uh, system here, which means we have only one motor in order to control two degrees of freedom. And the way we do that is by using the low frequent uh, range of mo the low frequent range to um, uh, to make it roll forward and backward, and to use the high frequent range in combination with an unbalanced rotor to generate torques that are orthogonal to its current path, and that would make it rotate. So in this very special case, we intentionally build an unbalanced rotor, something that you normally don't want. Normally you want the center of mass to be on the axle, you want a diagonal inertia tensor, 
Those are both things that we don't want in this device because we would like to have these additional torques about an axis that's not the uh, rotation axis of the device in order to change direction. And it appears like this is um, working quite nicely as we implemented it in a really, really simple prototype. You see the prototype always trying to go in, in one direction. It's a little bit cheating because the person is just standing where we know the ball wants to go, but you can see that the ball is always trying to go to one direction in space. Even though it has only one motor, it can still navigate quite well. Now the question of course is, what's the higher level goal of this? We can, we can somehow make this ball move, but can we make people also um, follow it or do they get motivated to do something with it? So we had this very nice workshop at the Movement Academy in Darmstadt this year and Ada Karaus Molnoglu, who's the PhD candidate uh, on this project, she tried to find out whether in a little hackathon, people would be able to program emotions into this robot and then later whether people would be capable of interpreting these emotions. And the whole reason why we do this is because we hypothesize that if you can some sort of can form some sort of emotional uh, band with the device, it will increase the motivation to move and play with it. Of course, there's lots of ethical questions behind this, but this is the first, first attempt to find out whether it's even possible to generate something like an emotion, emotional impression with the very limited um, actuation possibilities that this system has. So we had two groups, um, implement different controllers uh, with a very short time and we actually gave them a randomly assigned tasks uh, which emotion to generate and uh, one of the groups had to do um, uh, angry and the other one had to do sad and interestingly when we later looked at how people recognized this we saw that uh, people were at least quite consistent in what they realized. So the sad emotion was recognized quite well. The angry emotion wasn't really recognized so well, but almost everybody thought the ball was excited. And something else that we realized in this situation was that this, is, that this misinterpretation was mostly due to the fact that people handled the ball very differently from what the programmers had had done. So they held it in a specific way. And when you hold it in that way, indeed the ball appears angry. The moment that you hold it in a different way, which happened in the in the evaluation group, you see a different type of behavior. So that's uh, that apparently um, that is uh, dependent on the interaction itself. Of course, this is an extremely small uh, uh, first preliminary experiment. It just shows that even though we have no real expressiveness, uh, except for movement, it's still possible to create, to communicate uh, uh, such important things as emotions, uh, or at least to get a consistent interpretation of people, what is trying to be communicated. Now, next steps are, of course, we will need to uh, investigate this more. We need to learn strategies that maximize human interaction. And here I would like to say that we're also looking for people to help help uh, with that. So if you're interested in a position in Aachen, then please approach me. Okay, now coming to the conclusion, just some lessons that I have learned and that I hope can help you avoid some mistakes that I made is first of all, think well about the requirements, about each single requirement and whether it really is necessary and whether you have a good backing um, in case it needs uh, more complex design choices. And otherwise, if you're not sure, go for the simpler solution. Um, think about design constraints as a challenge to tr trigger creativity and find better solutions. So instead of thinking I'll first build everything in and then later maybe I'll reduce and take some out, Think about the constraints right from the start. Maybe there's a way that you can actually make it work with the, with the limited resources that are there and even potentially put on more artificial limitations that might not even be in the application and see whether you can come up with creative and leaner solutions. Nonlinear dynamics, passive dynamics can be very helpful. I showed some examples of how springs can be used, how springs can be even used for 
dual function series and parallel. And the most important lesson I learned, and I think many people learn over time, is that if you don't design your hardware well, you can't fix it with good control. So the most important decisions are made when you design the device. So think about it very well and don't rely on later algorithms to make any, any fixes. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Heike, for letting us uh, diving into your projects, uh, which are very uh, diverse, different different projects in different areas as well, uh, in the end. Um, the conclusion you just made is very similar also. To, it was another topic, but Max Eric Pusegravitz also said, yeah, you, you cannot fix a uh, hardware with, with the software. So th this is at least... Um, um, yeah, something that we have to remember. So different people say this. Um, and may may I ask you, you just you just um, summarized and concluded on how to prevent overengineering. How is it possible to detect overengineering when you are in the process of of developing? So is there some some warning signs, or is there even a framework that could be applied? to check uh, for over-engineering? Oh, I wish that would exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think just look at comparing your requirements to what you're building and make a projection on what will it cost, how difficult will it be to build, how difficult will it be for users to use, and ask yourself very honestly, is this really going to be um, a good solution. Um, maybe, maybe one more thing I could share is generate lots of possible ideas and don't fall in love with your first idea right away. And that can be helped if you don't start with cat drawings right away. So many students do that. They have a good idea, they go to CAD, and then they rarely start over again because CAD immediately looks so nice and polished that you think that it must be a good idea. <laughs> so I would suggest draw on paper as much as possible, as many possible solutions as you can, discuss with others on paper, and only then start working out solutions. I think that that helps finding better and less over-engineered solutions. Oh, I can give a tip on who gives really good lectures on this. That's Richard Marklin. He has a very nice YouTube channel, Freehand Sketcher, if you want to learn how to visually communicate with your hand. But I don't think there's a, a solution to detecting that it's too much it, because you don't know what the, what the best solution is. You, you're looking for the minimum, but you don't know where it is. So if you find it, Roland, please let me know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Maybe someone in the audience has also a, a tip or, or a framework on that, or at least to say some some checkpoints. And um, please ask the questions in the in the Q and A function. I will continue with another question. So, um, your um, balance support system that you have, do you think they would also be applicable in cybertron disciplines, like in? the exoskeleton discipline or also in the wheelchair discipline? Have you made studies in this direction? Um, well, we haven't made studies specifically to the cybathlon, but of course the idea of combining the gyroscope with an exoskeleton has come up multiple times. And it's not, um, not a crazy idea to think about doing that because it basically increases the margin of stability. It will not be... Um, a perfect solution to um, preventing falls, but it might make it a little bit easier for your controllers to um, to balance the person. But it's still, again, a complex technology that you're combining with another set of complex technology, the exoskeleton, and I'm not so sure that that's a great idea. All right. So, uh, but at least at least it's it's worth to 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 have some thoughts about it. So, mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, okay. Um. So uh, I have a completely different question. Um, so do you think also, it's more a personal question, finding the simpler solutions, uh, is it more rewarding for you in the end? Or would you be more rewarded if a more complex solution is 
also successful. Does that Let's make say sense? personally, personally, yes, it's more rewarding. In terms of grant funding, no. Okay. I really have a hard time finding grant funding for complex systems. It's a lot easier if you build something very fancy and complex. Ah, okay. Yeah, I yeah that's a little bit uh, yeah, that's my personal experience. But I think people are also slowly changing their minds. Okay. Yeah. Um, you you had one example um, where you said it was very hard for you. It's still some pain where where you failed with your with your approach. Um, was there maybe another approach or another project where you said this is a perfect example where I failed and where you had to restart from scratch again? Yes, yes. Yeah, I had to take some slides out because the yeah. lecture would have gotten too long. Um, one example is probably the prosthesis that we built in ETH. I think it was a really, really nice design. We had built a prosthesis, a leg prosthesis, Sash Piper built it. I'm sure you remember that. It was very nicely designed and it was capable of, ge of generating human-like stiffnesses and at least talk profiles. So we and, and uh, we showed that people could walk with it quite well, amputees, and that uh, we could also climb stairs with it. It was at a point in time when there were not so many active prostheses around, around 2012. So it seemed like a really nice solution, and we it was even featured on the cover of IEEE Pulse. But what happened in the end is that we didn't find anybody who would want to license the technology and it wasn't produced, it never got to the market, it never reached users. So of course, from a technology point of view, we had built a really nice device and you could say it was successful, but from translation to the actual lives of people, it was a, a failure. And I would say in that case, again, we had failed to look very closely at what the real requirements are and which people would need it for what. So I think we had built a solution that was too heavy for elderly people and not really necessary for active, young, uh, healthy people who could walk with a stick and didn't need such a complex solution. So I think in that case, we over-engineered probably because of the uh, yeah lack of looking into the real user requirements. So this question or did this answer relates very much to a question that we have in the audience. So how do you interact with the end users and how do you get the important requirements and what are important steps in translating them into engineering language? This was a question of Veronica. Yeah. Well, first of all, I as an engineer need to realize that I'm not the best person at doing this. So I have to interact with people who are specialists in getting the requirements uh, from users. So for example, industrial designers are really good at that. Of course, clinicians who interact with their, with their clients or who themselves have certain desires, they have to be very closely in the loop. Also companies have to be very much in the loop from the very start. So all the real successes in the way that devices made it to the market had users as part of the team and companies as part of the team. So those really helped get the requirements straight right at the start. And we really developed according to that V model. So starting with the requirements and investing a lot of time into that. All right. And maybe to the, to the second part of the question, what are important steps in translating the requirements into engineering language? Maybe here also the company's support somehow. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, of course, um, th there are methods to do this. And one of the best methods is to also iterate very quickly. So make little mock-ups of what you think the user wants, even though it's not functional at all, but just somehow pretends to do what, what the user, what, what you understood what the user wanted, and then check whether that's actually what they wanted. Of course, you need some creativity in making mock-ups that somehow resemble uh, what the final product will do and be. So this way, really, yep. Yeah. And 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 I'm not the best person to ask this. You should really ask the industrial designers because they have really good methods, systematic methods to find out what people really want. Okay, and this relates again to the next question of, of Mel Korka. Uh, how do you make sure to keep the end users' needs in mind during the development? So this is an also you you ask the experts in the in for doing that. So the experts. Yeah. For users yeah, and, and the end users. So you, yeah. whenever you have made something or you're about to take any sort of decision, 
he try and talk it over with with the people who really will be using it in the end. So don't don't take the requirements and then bury yourself for a year building the device and then going back. That that won't work because even if you think you know exactly what the user wants, you you don't. Plus, the user can change their mind once they see how it's really shaping up. So I would say constant constant involvement, which which can be painful, of course, and uh, is a good idea to do that early on and consistently. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe maybe a last question uh, from my side uh, or, or or more a thought. So we discussed also in the last after the last lecture that reports about failing are a bit missing in in research yes what what do you think so should there be a journal of of of, of failing or a, it exists or, there is such a journal is. okay so i'm not too much into research anymore but yeah yes it exists and also i realized that it's a lot easier now to publish to publish those um, negative findings. So we recently published negative findings on another knee prosthesis where we actually failed to show um, any of the benefits that we were hoping for and said it made things worse. So, and we made a study and we we still published it and it was, it there was no problem in the review process. Uh, reviewers still appreciated it. So I think you just need to dare to do it. You can still publish negative findings of course, it's it's painful that you did all this work. It didn't turn out the way that we that you were hoping to, but it's very, very helpful to others to avoid that same mistake. Oh, then let's let's go to the to the last question that we have from uh, Shayan, uh, uh, based on the or also relating to the previous question. What do you believe are the present critical market demands on active leg prosthetic? I'm not sure how much you are into leg prosthetics because it has been a while. Um, yeah. Well, so. we're still working on leg prosthetics. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm, I, I can make any claim to knowing what the market demands are. We think that what we are building meets a market demand and that is look at um, support for standing up because for elderly people it's very difficult to get out of a chair and it's so much more difficult if you have to do it with one leg i mean just try to do it yourself now from the desk try to stand up with one leg it's so difficult so that's something that we're trying to address and we're looking at basically a solution that pretty much focuses only on that so it doesn't make walking better or more energetic it really helps with standing up of course, you're always tempted to do more than that. And then you think once we have built this, maybe it can even do more than that. But the main focus is really looking at, at helping people stand up. Maybe just a short follow-up question also from Shayan. So also to related to your topic, to make things easier, not over-engineer, it has an impact on the on the price, finally, of, of the device, which may be very is very important also for leg prosthesis for, for producing. yes absolutely and and that's also why it's helpful to have a company involved right away because they will make sure you don't build something that's uh, that won't be sold they normally have ways of of finding that out and making good predictions and if you if you involve them early on and not try to translate your technology after you have a nice prototype but to build it from the beginning on with the company, then that's a much safer path towards something that can actually be sold. Right. Thank you so much, um, Heike. I think with that, we close the Q&A session. Um, thanks again for, for this very interesting task, for, for supporting also us with the Cyberton lectures. That That's yeah. great. Thank you so much, Heike. Thank you. Thanks a lot and hope to see you soon again somewhere. Hopefully. I <laughs> I will quickly make an outlook to close the Cybertron lecture number number four. So next Cybertron lecture will be um, in two weeks, actually. Uh, we have there Cesar uh, Cadena from ETH Zurich, and he will talk about machine scene understanding, limitations and opportunities also related to uh, Cybertron disciplines. Um, his laboratory from ETH Zurich will also participate in the assistance robot race, the RSL lab, uh, lab from ETH Zurich. So register now if you have not already registered. Yet we are looking forward to, to welcome you either at ETH Zurich in the uh, Audimax or also again online.
Then again, the announcement for the Cybertron Challenges 2024. Stay tuned for the challenges on February 2 next year. And of course, then we are looking forward to see many of you as a team or as audience at the Cybertron 2024 in October. With that, I would like to close the Cybertron lecture number four and see you soon again. Thank you so much.